Joining me now is Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, a ranking member of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations, Small Business and Entrepreneurship and Health Committees. Senator, thanks very much for being here. You just heard that about a subpoena from Richard Blumenthal. Should Alejandro Mayorkas be subpoenaed to start giving us some answers on these things which he is overseeing, not just the wide open border where 10 million illegals have come on his watch, but also overseeing the Secret Service, where we're getting no information on these assassination attempts? Well, Secretary Mayorkas has a history of not being very forthcoming. I will say one of the most important things that we've asked the Secret Service for was denials of security. So the Trump security detail, Secret Service detail, as well as the Trump campaign for months and months requested more security, and this was denied by the Secret Service. They know it. I've asked the director. They've looked into it, but they haven't shared any of it with us. We know that in Butler County was the first time that they had counter snipers there. Thank God. If they had not had the counter snipers there, that, that shooter would have continued and uh, Donald Trump would have surely been killed as well as many more people. He was taken down pretty quickly, but there was a host of errors. He never should have gotten on the roof. They saw him for 90 minutes, but never stopped the proceeding in order to interview him or interdict him. They knew he was on the roof, man on a roof, man on a roof for three minutes. That was broadcast to the control tent, and yet Trump was still not taken from the stage. So the first assassination attempt, error after error after error, but these were errors of willpower, not manpower. Now, like Washington, everything else, somebody fails at their job, you give them more money. No, why don't we uh, replace the people who didn't do their job and have better people in those positions? With the most recent attack, what kind of security is it that doesn't sweep a fence? It's unbelievable. That doesn't go around and sweep the perimeter? Now, local law enforcement had said if he had been president, there would be sufficient perimeter set up for him. So it is a different type of security. We're a big country. The Secret Service has lots of people and lots of money. They can provide better service, but it requires more intelligent uh, uh, analysis of what he needs for security. But, I mean, what do you think is going on here? I mean, you know, shouldn't the level of protection match the level of the threat? After the first assassination attempt, the FBI said there will be more. Th that was the point to say there will be more. We're expecting it. We need um, to get ahead of it. Yeah, without question, with two assassination attempts within about a two-month period, he needs more protection. Something bad is going to happen. But what we also have to have is a discussion in our country where networks like CNN and MSNBC are daily saying that he is a danger to mm -hmm. democracy and someone has to do something about yeah. it. These left-wing these left networks aren't saying he has bad policy. Yeah. Hillary Clinton wasn't saying he had bad policy. She's saying he's a danger. Yeah. The implication is we won't be able to stop him through the election. We must stop him otherwise. And they are inciting every crazy or angry person in our country. And frankly, CNN and MSNBC need to tone down their rhetoric because they are part of the incitement to violence. Yeah, Hillary Clinton yesterday said she doesn't understand why the media can't get on this narrative. It's a, a consistent narrative that Trump is a threat. This from the woman who lied and made up a story that Trump colluded with Russia back in 2016 and actually paid for a Steele dossier uh, to come up with uh, just embellishment and, and lies and, and, and actually made it go viral across the world. She has some nerve calling somebody else a threat. Yeah, Hillary Clinton was the only one I know of who actually colluded with Russia. <laughs> exactly. Bizarre, completely exactly. bizarre how they've, how they've taken this and twisted and twisted. But, you know, then the concern is that, you know, the Department of Justice is supposed to be somewhat independent. They're appointed by President Biden. And the question is, since they're using lawfare against Donald Trump in the federal courts right now by, you know, trying to go after, I think, uh, spurious type of charges right. that are politically motivated, now do we trust them to investigate and to protect the former president. This, a, this is where we are, where we doubt them. Well, that, that's very discouraging, unfortunately. And the politicization in all of these agencies obviously runs deep, the DOJ included. I want to move on to the Middle East, though. At least nine people killed, thousands of others reportedly injured yesterday in Lebanon by exploding pager devices.
ISIS in an attack reportedly targeting Hezbollah terrorists. The Lebanese government is blaming Israel for what appeared to be a sophisticated remote attack. The explosions detonated simultaneously. Israeli officials declining to comment. Hezbollah members began carrying pagers instead of strictly using cell phones over concerns that the Israeli government could track their phones, Senator. Your thoughts on where we are in all of these wars right now and what this administration has been advising Israel to do about the attacks on Israel. Yeah, you know, if these were terrorists, it's hard to have a lot of sympathy for them. But I do think that as warfare gets to the point where we attack people individually with drones or pagers, we're going to live in a world where nobody's safe anywhere. I mean, where no person can be safe giving a speech that a drone might attack them. We have $300 drones that can take out a $3 million tank now. So the next stage of warfare is this individual warfare. The other thing about killing terrorists is, and you know, it's hard not to justify killing terrorists, but when the collateral damage happens, what happens is that more terrorists are created often. And so it's a never ending type of cycle. And there has to be a somewhere in this cycle people who are willing to actually have some discussions. Yeah. Even, even though October 7th, there's absolutely no justification as a horrific massacre, there still has to be someone talking about a future for what happens in Gaza, whether or not there could be some sort of international port or a port that Israel controls to allow some economic uh, improvement to enter into Gaza. Yeah. This isn't because I have any sympathy for Hamas, because I don't want Hamas to continue. You have to somehow encourage or allow some kind of economic opportunity in these areas. And really, frankly, the Arab countries surrounding Gaza have an obligation to try to make it a safer place yeah. and to have somebody to deal with other than Hamas. Senator, speaking of the economy here in the U.S., we just spoke with one of your uh, uh, favorite uh, researchers. That was Jim Grant from Grant's Interest Rate Observer. He was in the studio. And uh, I want to get your take on the $35 trillion in debt that we face. Uh, experts are weighing in on some of Trump and Harris's proposals. Trump has vowed no tax on tips, no tax on Social Security, no tax on overtime. Promising workers who clock more than 40 hours a week tax free overtime income. Last night, Trump posted on Truth Social that he would lift the cap on state and local tax deductions, a key piece of his 2017 tax law, actually. Harris echoed Trump's no tax on tips, but with a few exceptions, she's proposing a $50,000 tax deduction for small business startups, a huge jump from the current $5,000 deduction. The Tax Foundation says Harris's small business breaks would be drowned out by all of her plans to raise taxes. She wants higher taxes on corporate income, higher taxes on capital gains. She wants to put a 25% unrealized uh, tax in for unrealized gains there, as you know, Senator. How do you size up these two economic plans? Well, there, if you look at all the taxes being proposed by Kamala Harris, there, it's a net new taxes will vastly outweigh any reductions in taxes. So it will be a tax increase. And when you increase taxes on the economy, you take money from the productive economy and you send it to the non-productive economy, which is the government. Now, neither party is really talking much about spending, though. And spending is the problem here. It really isn't. When we cut taxes in 2017, if you look at revenue on two-year cycles, Art Laffer's looked at this and talked about it on your network, revenue actually rose as we cut rates. This happened in the 1980s with Reagan. We still debate this, but supply-side economic works. You, you lower rates, people are more productive, they pay more in taxes. Yep. But really, both parties need to talk about cutting spending. So I'll introduce a budget this week, and it will be voted on because neither the Republicans or the Democrats took the time to do a budget, so they'll have to vote on mine. And mine's called the Six Penny Plan, cuts six percent across the board each year for five years and balances the budget in five years. I think that's the least we can do, and I promote it every year, and I get somewhere between about 15 to 30 votes, no Democrats, so there is no Democrat yep. concern for cutting spending, but I will get about half the Republicans. That's excellent, Senator. We're going to be watching your budget. Uh, do you find it odd that the Senate refuses to bring the SAVE Act to the floor? They don't want to hear anything about protecting the vote? It's hard to imagine why they would want non-citizens to vote. What, what kind of country is it with non-citizens vote? I, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to understand Democrats being opposed to it. Senator, thank you so much for being here this morning. Good to see you, sir.